G'day Bifrosters! In today's tutorial we're going to go through fractal generation and obviously I'll show you how to do it in Bifrost. We're looking at a combination of the superb mineral creation graph by the Houdini artist Armin Lofi over at Simpler Procedural and David Ferreira aka CG Monkey King his amazing mineral creation project. I hope I pronounced both of those correctly. Apologies if I didn't. David's projects are super cool whereas Armin does deeper dive tutorials and is super super focused on proceduralism. Both of them are incredible. David and Armin Sudini work is really good to convert to Bifrost. It's, they get really nice results. And when you combine them, you get a much, much deeper understanding of the procedural nature of the thing. I'm not going to bounce back and forth between two tutorials and, and the Bifrost, because that's three things. But I will link to the tutorials in the description. And, and please, please, please go and check them out. They're both awesome. All right, let's get started. So here we are. The screen with the most possibilities, our favourite screen, and where we start. First thing I'm going to need is the platonic solid. So let's put that down. I'm going to use a dodecahedron. I'm going to have one subdivision, radius of three. And I'll turn off the spherical inflation, so let's create that. Doesn't quite look right yet, but that's because what we need to do is come over to our input here and take our subdivisions down to zero. And there's our dodecahedron and fancy sitting there by itself being a platonic solid. So let's do that again, but this time, instead of a dodecahedron, let's put down a cube because it's a very different shape. And I'm going to do the same stuff. I'll go across to my channel box, my inputs, and I'll set those subdivisions to zero. Now, you notice we haven't quite gone into Bifrost yet. This is, there's a reason for that. We're going to do a couple of other things first. First thing I really want to do with these guys is I'm going to bevel them. So let's just do a bevel. So here are the settings I found to be best for this particular radius. This will change depending on what size your platonic solids are. I'll just do that. So it's just a slight bevel and let's, uh, let's do that on the cube as well. Next thing of course is naming everything because that's a very good thing to do. And this way I won't get mixed up later. So that is all of the Maya stuff we're going to be doing today. I'm going to just hide these guys and it's time to start Bifrost. So Let's just close down our outline and give ourselves a bit more space and create a graph. As you saw by the pretty, pretty pictures in the introduction, we're doing some minerals today. And really the way we're going to do it is by fractally generating them. Now this is not a true fractal. It doesn't use the fractal equation per se, but the way it's fractal or pseudo fractal is that we're going to loop around a loop and take the result of that loop to do the next iteration of the loop. It's pretty fractal, and from now on, I'm just going to call it fractals. So first thing to do, I, sh I closed down my outline too early, is I need to bring in these two. If I bring them in together like that, they will come in as a single array. That's not what I want. What I want to do is bring them in separately so that we have got less need to do any strange array shenanigans, really. So there I have my dodecahedron and my cube. We're ready to go. Of course, the first thing we'll do is drop down and iterate. Now, this is a type of loop, and like I said before, what this allows you to do is take what comes out of the loop and put it back in. And I'll show you how that all gets set up now. But the first thing I need to mention, if you've used Bifrost before, most people will delete that. We're not going to delete that because what that's going to become is the number of times we go around the fractal loop. So I'll set it to a low number to start with, something like four, and keep going from there. So let's get this loop set up before we do anything else. What I'm going to do, I'm going to rename this again, just to keep my how and head straight and I'm going to drop this into the iterate loop twice then break the connections. The thing to do here is just to make sure that these are set to amino object. We'll rename that and I'm going to connect that one to the output. Rename it, to iterate out and then break the connection and again make sure that this is set to amino object. But now all I need to do is set the port state between iterate in and iterate out. And that tells Bifrost that if we use this input, whether anything's connected to it outside or not, it is pulling whatever comes out of this side of the loop for however, however many times we want to do it. The first thing that we connect is the dodecahedron mesh, which is there. Can't see anything yet, but that's all right. We'll get to that in a minute. Why not? Let's just put that into the output for now. And let's drop down a terminal because Terminals are good things. Now we've got our terminal, we can have a look at what's going on. So here is our dodecahedron inside of Bifrost. Alright, so this isn't quite doing what we want it to do yet. 
we want this to be the first iteration of the loop. So this is the, the master shape upon which all other shapes are built to get our fractal, which is great. But at the moment, Bifrost is, is basically saying anything that comes out of here has got to go into here. And then if that is set to this, it's just going to loop continuously. You can see that nothing's happened. So what I need to do is put in an equal and we'll take the current index of our loop. Because remember, this is a loop. It starts at zero and goes up from there. So right now I've got it set to be four iterations, which means the first one will be zero, the second one will be one, the third one would be two, and the fourth one would be three. So we're going to use this current index to find out which iteration of the loop we're on and to do some logic. If I pop this into the first and leave the second at zero, so now what I'm saying is, is the current index equal to zero? And this little orange guy is going to provide us a Boolean output. It's going to tell us if it's true or false, basically. So we'll put down an if statement like this. And what I'm going to say is that if if this is true, if the current index is equal to zero, then I want to use the mesh coming in from outside. But if it's not equal to zero, because the loop is always climbing, basically anything that isn't zero is going to be greater than zero. It's going to be one, two, three, four, or five. That's not so important for now. What we're saying is that if it's not the first time through the loop, use this. And then we'll put this out to the output and this will turn up again. What we've essentially made is the world's simplest solver at this point where something comes in, our loop checks to see which iteration it's on and decides accordingly what it's going to output for you to use. So that just means that anything we want to do, we need to do in this space between this if statement and this output statement. Now we need to start making our fractals. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to scatter some points on this guy. So at the moment, we don't know what iteration we're on. The loop is, is going to be always running round and round and round. But I know that every time it goes through the loop, I'm going to need to make more of these. So let's start with a point scatter. Let's scatter points like that. And to start with, a thousand is way too big. The thing with an iterative loop like this that, that adds to itself as it goes around is that it gets really big really, really quickly. So if I left that at a thousand, the first time through the loop, it would scatter a thousand points. The second time through the loop, it would scatter another thousand points. So that's 2000 points. And you can see it growing from there. It gets really big and really heavy really quickly. So I'm just going to start with four points. Nice and simple, nice and easy. And then because I want this to be replicated on those points, I'm going to put down an instance node. And what this basically means is I'm taking these points and I am attaching an instance of this geometry to them. And if we set our iterations back to one, we can have a look at what's going on there. So you can see what it's done is it's taken our original one, scattered some points on it, and then made copies of our original on those points. This is really cool, but what if I want to keep scattering? What if I wanted to put this back up to four? It's just disappeared completely. And the reason for that is that what's coming in on the first time through the loop is geometry from Maya. It's this the decahedron here. What's coming through the second time are these instances, and these instances are a point object. They're not actually geometry, they're not a mesh. If we have a look at the properties here, you can see that it's got a point component and a point instance ID. And that's telling the instancer which one of these geometries to instance onto it. But what's actually going out is points. So what we need to do real quick is bake those instances back to geometry. If we just use it instance geometry. There we go. And now if I set my iteration, you can see that it's scattered four more points on our first iteration and then instanced on those, which, which leads us to the next one. The next thing that has to happen is to keep these iterations. At the moment, if I set that to zero, you just get nothing. If I set it to one, you'll get the first set of instances. If I set it to two, you'll get points scattered on those instances and then instanced again, three, same again, and so forth and so forth. It's not keeping the intermediate instances and we need it to keep those instances. And we'll achieve that by adding a merge geometry in here. And merge geometry just does what it says. It takes whatever you put into it, merges it into a single geometry and outputs it again. The reason it's not very happy is that it's kind of expecting an array to come in here. And what I can do is I set that to fan in. Now it's expecting the elements of an array. So I'm merging the geometry after it's baked and I'm gonna merge it with whatever comes out of this if statement. And now if we output this, you can see it's kept the original, the first one, and the second, and now the fourth and fifth and sixth ones. So 
That's doing pretty well. That's, that's going pretty well. That's almost what we want. So basically what we need to do now is introduce some random elements into this. So maybe they scale a little and they rotate a little between each iteration. So to do that, I'm going to come and work on my points here before they go into the instances. And I'm going to do a randomize point scale. What this node does is it essentially just randomizes the scale of each point between 0.5 and 2. Let's hook that up. Things suddenly get very, very big and reasonably overwhelming. Don't worry about that. That's all good. Get that back to 2. Because it's doing what it said it would. It's randomizing the scale and it's randomizing it between 0.5 and 2. What this needs to be is always getting smaller. So the more iterations you go through, the smaller and smaller and smaller things get. Put in 0.25 for our minimum and 0.75 for our maximum. And this is looking a lot more like you'd expect a fractal to look. And if we up our iterations here, so we go to three, the next ones are smaller again, smaller again, and you can just keep going up, but you get the idea. So each time around the loop, these points are getting smaller. And you can see here that if I open this out and if we change this, you can see that it has quite a large effect. A very small changes inside of the loop will make for really large changes as a result. The other thing we need to talk about is the random seeds for things. You can see that this has a seed and this has a seed. And then when we put in the, the randomizer rotation, that's going to have a seed as well. That means that if I change the seed, you can see that I'm getting a drastic change in scale. The points aren't moving. The points are still being scattered on the same part of the object, but the scales random is changing wildly. So we'll be able to use that to our advantage later. If I wanted the points to move on the object, then I can change the seed here. You can see you're getting different scatters for different seeds. You have an awful lot of control over how things, the final looks by just changing that seed. Great, so that's scale done and scale's working. You can change this and get a different look. You can see it all expand and contract. Of course, the one in the middle, the very first iteration, that won't change. So if you needed a different look from that, you could change what's coming into Bifrost by simply plugging in a different object. It's a different kind of crystal, but it also looks pretty cool. What we also need to do is rotate these each time we go through the loops, which is randomized point rotation. It does very much the same thing. And you can see I'm just da daisy chaining this up. And now it's changed again, uh, except this time, instead of min and max scale, we're working with min and max radians. But if I change those radians, you can see them rotate. You can get quite a few good looks by just changing these settings. So you've got a superb amount of control here. That That's pretty good, really. Randomized scale and rotation. Well, that'll teach me to try scrubbing my max iterations. We just suffered a crash, but we're back and everything's looking as it should be. So moving on from randomized rotation and scale, because we're using scatter by number here, I can actually change the scatter mode from random to blue knot. And I will need a few more iterations to show this off. What you can see here is if I change this, you get vastly different fractals. This is what random is giving me. It's a nice tight packed crystal structure, which is quite nice and quite good to use. What blue noise tends to generate is, is elongated complex crystal structures, which is also good. So it's down to what you want to use, really. The difference is, is that randomly scattering just randomly scatters the points anywhere on the object. So what you can end up and, and do end up getting is a lot of points very close together, sometimes interpenetrating like this. What blue noise does is it tries to spread those points out as much as possible. If I take my iterations right down to one. see the difference quite well here. So this is a blue noise scatter where it's tried to get the points as far away from each other as possible. If I change that back to random, you can see that the points are a lot closer together and, and in this case they're actually overlapping. So that's the difference there and in a minute I'm going to show you how to get rid of this little problem and also how to port all of your controls out so you're not forever diving into the loop to change something or, or check a seed. Speaking of seeds, all of these need seeds. So the nice thing about a loop is this current index is always a different number. It's zero the first time round, one the second time round, two the third time. What you can use this to, to do is to provide a seed. Every time through the loop it's going to calculate different positions rather than here which is calculating a lot of the same positions all the way through the loop. Let's push our iterations up just a little bit, just to one to illustrate this, or two rather. 
So you can see lots and lots of interpenetration going on here because the same seed is going into the scatter. If I put a different seed for every iteration, suddenly the random becomes not quite so on top of each other and you're getting quite a nice look. Now I can just put the same seed into the scale and into the rotation like this. And that's great. That looks great. I'd like to vary that up a bit. So the first thing I'm going to do is add something to the seed. And this is where the concept of adding new controls to this comes in. So what I actually want to do is I want to have the user control the seed. So let's add a new set of inputs. And I'm just going to name that so that I know that these are the inputs for my random numbers. So in here, I'm going to make a seed. So what I want to do is take this current index and add this new seed value to it. Let's quickly rename that. And now I have whatever's being input here plus the current index. And I'm going to put that into my seed. And you can see it's snapped to its new positions. But now if I if I change this seed something somewhat, you can generate an entirely new fractal just by changing this one number. So this is providing the seed for the random number generator by combining the current index and the random input. Now I want to do that also for scale and rotate. So I could do something like this again, but let's do it with multiply. It's the same method. We take the index, we multiply it by whatever number is being given to us from the inputs. We'll put this into both scale and rotation. So we can take a look in here. So if I change that seed, can see that all aspects are changing randomly. Now this is not quite enough control. I did promise a lot of control. So let's add some more to those controls. Well, the first thing I want to add is the scatter mode. So that's just a matter of dragging this out and dropping it into the controls. And so now I can change from random to blue noise right here. Let's do the same for the point scale and the point rotation. So we'll take the minimum scale and the maximum scale. And I will rename these because it's sensible to remember what you're doing later on. Great. And now I'll do the same for the radians. I'm happy to leave those as they are. I know that radians are another way of describing rotation. And you can always put in a degree to radians conversion if you'd rather work in degrees. However, what that looks like now is I have these controls on the outside of my loop. There they are. So I can change my scale. You can see it change. I can change my rotation. You can watch that change as well, which is lovely. So this just gives you a lot of control, not just how your pseudo fractals look, but if you push them hard enough, you'll get different fractals as well. And you can get... So we've started getting some controls out. Now let's drop our iterations back down to one again, and we'll change our scatter mode to random. You can see what's happening here is that the points that are being scattered on the object Two of them have turned up inside each other. So if I zoom all the way inside, I should be able to see where that's coming from. And I can. You can see there's one there and there's one there. We want to try and avoid that. And the easiest way, of course, to avoid it is by using blue noise, which tries to spread the points out as much as possible. However, if we quite like the way random's looking, giving us a, a tight crystal formation like this, then We'll need to come up with another way. Now, normally you would do something like at this stage, turn everything into a volume before you go back out around the loop. That would guarantee that the points are on the outside of the resulting object. The trouble with that is that converting things to volumes is very, very slow. We need to come up with a more geometry based way to do it. And so let me show you what I've come up with. And we're going to need to do this between the scatter and the randomize. So basically, if let's, let's get our, our iterations down so that we're not hurting too much. Basically, what I want to do now is I want to see the points that it's scattering. And the easiest way to do that is to run this guy through a point scope. This will just allow me to output my points as disks so I can literally see what I'm doing. So I'll throw down a terminal real quickly. And you won't see anything just yet. But if I hide, well, sorry, if I go to wireframe, you can see I've got one, two, three points there. Now, if I change my seed, I can try and get something with a bit better, say maybe four points like that. That's super interesting. Let's just... You can see that these four points are sitting on 
the outside of the last iteration coming in. Because this is iteration zero, you've got this one here, which comes in from Maya, that's that dirty there. And then these points are being scattered on top of it. If I go up one more, and now you can see that the entire thing has been baked and is being scattered on top of that. So really what we're trying to do is we're trying to see if any of these points are sitting inside the last iteration's geometry. And we can do that with a ray cast. So I'm going to make a new compound and I'm going to just do some quick renaming. I'm going to need the point positions. And finally, I'm going to need the geometry that we're scattering on. So now let's jump in here and the very first thing I'm going to put down is a raycast. Get raycast locations. And the way this works is returns the locations of the closest intersection of rays on the surface of a geometry. There's our geometry and here's our positions. So it's going to shoot a ray at that geometry from those positions in this direction. And we don't have the directions right now. And this is where scatter by number becomes in really, really handy because scatter by number will transfer properties to the points from the object that you're scattering on. So in this case, I want the point normal. And this comes in by default, which is fine. But it allows us to just take our scattered points, get their point normals, like that. And I can use that as my direction because the point normals are being passed on to the scatter points from the geometry they're being scattered on. So there's going to be the normal is going to be facing out from that geometry. So we'll just put those in there. And because I'm a visual person and I like to see what I'm doing, I'm going to put down a location scope. This is just going to enable me to see what's going on with these raycasts. So again, the geometry goes in here, the positions go in here, the directions go here, and our locations go here. And very, very quickly, I'm able to put down a terminal and visualize those. It takes a little minute to sort itself out. So immediately you see these weird colored triangles turn up and what these guys are doing, these are the rays being shot out. And the reason that they're so short is because that they are immediately hitting the surface that they're based on. So to combat that, to get them to go outwards is set up a very, very small minimum distance. And you see that they've all changed. And they've all changed from colorful arrows to dark blue arrows that all go the same distance. And that's because what that is telling me is it's not finding any intersection. So the rays are not hitting anything. And that's perfect, that's what we want. But it doesn't always happen that way. So now I have to go and try and engineer a bad one so we can see, see how to fix it. There we are. That's what a point inside of an object looks like. It's firing a ray outwards and it's hitting the next object. These guys aren't doing it so much. It looks like they are but they aren't. It's checking for collisions against something that isn't quite there yet. It's been scattered, but it hasn't been instanced. But this one is, is telling me that it's finding an intersection. What that means is that I can now take these points and just delete them. And it will change the shape of the fractal. It'll get rid of the entire branch starting from this point. Also allow us to avoid any self penetration like we were having before. So to do that, we just jump back in here. And Raycast gives us this awesome found output, which what that is, is it's an array of booleans that are either true or false. If they're true, then it's found a hit. If it's false, then they're the dark blue areas and it hasn't. We essentially want everything that's true in that array, and we have a compound for that. Find all an array. So what this is doing is it's trying to find anything, all of the instances of this in an array. And in our case, we wanted to find all of the true instances. So find me everything in, in that array that is true. Because this array here and the points in our scattered points object are in the same order. I can use this list of indices to delete points from our scattered points. And all I have to do is plug that in there. Because it's just giving me the indices of anything in that array that's true. And then I can output that. Okay, great. We don't need this anymore. So rather than deleting it, I might want to come back and use it later to check. I'm just going to turn it off. So nothing on this branch will be calculated now. Go up one and let's just go back to shaded for a minute. And let's see what happens when we remove the points that are intersecting. You can see a whole bunch of the fractal just disappeared because 
it's killing the points that were self-intersecting. And so those branches are no longer being scattered. Okay, so now we've got that working. We'll call this color inside, just so we know what it's doing later. And we no longer need these guys, so we'll just get rid of those. So now we've just got one more thing to change and we can get on to some of the other cool stuff. What I want to do is I want to change the amount of points that are scattered every time around the loop. Just like doing the seeds with the add and multiply here, it's the same kind of thing. What we're going to need to do is introduce another random number. So I'll add a random value. And we'll just use the current index as the seed, and this will guarantee a different random value every time. And now all we need to do is output the min and the max here to our input. So let's put the minimum out and the maximum out. And I will rename those to min and max points per iteration. All good. So what's happening here is every time we go around the loop, this is going to generate a new random number between this number and this number. And then we can just output that number to the amount. Just to keep this as a full whole number, so rather than 4.678239, I'm just going to use round to nearest node. Like that. Then I can take that and I can plug that into my amount. Once again, our fractal will change. There we go. Right now, this is kind of a crystal, but it is not the crystal that we were looking for. The reason for that is these are at default. They're at zero and one. So we started with four points. So let's go three here. And you can see it's already filled out some more. And then we'll go, oh, six, just for giggles, out here. So now every time through the loop, it's scattering between three and six points on the geometry that came in from the last one which is cool. So we can change that as well. Go to seven, because it's just rounding to the nearest anyway. And all of our rules that we set up, like the interpenetrations and the culling and stuff, that's still there and that's still working. So great. If we change this over to blue noise, like so and let's up our iterations maybe to eight. Now we're cooking with crystals. We're starting to really get the right look going on here, which is awesome. We can change our number of points. I mean, we say four at the beginning. And like I said, every change you make at the beginning makes a lot of changes all the way through. You can change the seed until you get one that you do, which is nice. You can change your, change your minimum and maximum scale to get a different look. So if you want chunkier crystals, you can do this. Just, all I did was push up the, min the minimum scale of it. And that's pretty much giving us some really good looking results. Where to from here? Well, the biggest thing that strikes me, I got, I got a couple of things I could add to this. The biggest thing that strikes me is that these are all dodecahedrons, which is, which is wonderful. But we could add variation to this. And we could add variation to this by, in our instances, we've only got one instance geometry. And we can add as many instance geometries as we like. So let's try that. First thing I'll do is I'll jump back up. And I'll just show you. If I, if I plug in this cube shape to my dodecahedron mesh. You can see it's the same fractal. It's now just being made all with cubes, which is obviously a different fractal, but it still looks pretty good. I can plug the sphere in too. Now you've got the same fractal, but with spheres. That's looking quite molecular, I gotta say. So this is all good, but this is all changing the main one. What what do we do, say, if we wanted to do another platonic solid and we wanted to have an octahedron, Triangle subdivisions one radius three is great. Quickly rename this. Now, for those of you that play Dungeons and Dragons, you're going to recognize this almost straight away. So now I've got an octahedron. Let's pop that in there and see what happens. Yep, that's your eight-sided dice right there. So now we've got all of these, all of these really cool things that we can do. But what they do is they they change everything. It's only really instancing one thing. So let's let's have some fun with that and see how we could get a variant going. So I'm going to put in the cube into here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this port type to an object array and then set that to fan in again. So this is going to accept in as many objects as we want to put in it. It's going to build an array in this order. So at the moment we'd have the cube is mesh one and the oct octahedron is mesh three. That turns up on our main input here, which is awesome. And I'm just going to pop it out here. So you get closer to the instances and we'll just put a pass node down just so we can bring it out all out to here. So this whole array is still coming out of here. Now I know there's two, two in the array, so I'm going to get the first an array like that. And I'm going to get the last in the way. And because I'm clever and I remember things, I'm going to change that to Q and change that to Alt. I have two variants I can play with. Let's get those plugged in. Now, if I just straight up plug in the cube into my instance geometries, you've got your dodecahedron coming in here. 
and there are still dodeca the decahedrons everywhere. And then you've got your cube coming in beneath it, and there's cubes all through here. And I can do the same thing too with the octahedron. I can plug that in. And now you've got a combination of dodecahedrons, cubes, and somewhere in this pile will be octahedrons as well. There's one. And this is just how instances work. Create instances. I've got a random selection mode on, which has a seed, which we'll be probably using later, putting seeds in. All good. So that means it's choosing from these three objects randomly and then instancing it to a point, which is all good. What we're able to do though, is we're able to control this. So if I switch this instances selection mode to none, then it's always going to put in the first mesh in the list, which in this case is our dodecahedron. If I set it to sequential, it's going to put in our dodecahedron, this one, which is a cube, and then this one, and then it's going to, it's going to keep repeating that for as many number of points there are. Then we have random, and we can use our probability curve to choose what comes in. So what this is saying, by the time we get here, it's all dodecahedrons, because the zero coming in is equaling the zero going out. And as we move this back out, you can see that it, starts to add more and more things based on the rent. I'm just going to leave that for now and we're going to set up a different node that helps control us helps us control all of that after the fact. Randomize selection by probabilities. If I play that in and that out. And the very first thing we should see is that it all jumps back to dodecahedrons because they now have twice the probability of being chosen than the cube does. If I make that two and two then we're going to get, and it of course changes the fractal because it's built off what it iterates on as these things go. And as I drop the probability for the cube, you can see that it starts to drop how that's all worked out. I can go 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and then I've got the same probability for both. So there's 50% chance that there's a dodecahedron and a 50% chance there's a cube. And now I can also go, let's put our octahedrons in as well. And they all have the same probability of being chosen. If we want mostly dodecahedrons, change this to a 1 or a 2, and you start to bring these guys down. So a very low probability of these two, quite often by changing that, you get different values. So if I say 0 0.1, lots of cubes to it. It's quite sensible. sensible. So I'm going to build a system that, that allows us to change these based on the iteration. But let's just put these in a group or in its own compound. Just going to say. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take our current index bring that up here and put it into a pass node and then I'm going to increment it. First I'm going to do this twice so copy that and paste that. First one I'm going to increment by 4. The second one I'm going to increment by 8. I'm going to convert them both to a float and then I'm going to use a, a new compound called 1 over. What this does is it takes 1 and divides by whatever's coming in here. So in this case what's going to come in here is 4 on the first iteration, 5 on the next one, 6 on the next one. When it comes out of here, it's going to be 1 quarter, 1 fifth, 1 sixth, 1 seventh, 1 eighth, etc. So this is going to continually get smaller and smaller, and this is going to be even smaller. And what I'm going to do with these is plug them into my randomized selection by probabilities based on which variant I want. So probability 0 here is the dodecahedron. That's the first thing that comes in, and I always want those. You can change this up if you like and see what results you get. But the next one coming in is the cube. But let's plug these in anyway. So the top one here, this is our cube. We can plug that into probability one and the fractal will change. You're getting a lot more cubes. And then plug this one into probability two, which is our octahedron. And that's being overwhelmed by the other probabilities. So the way we can fix that is we can start bringing this down. Or, of course, we can change these numbers. So let's in increment that one by 40 and that one by 20. And now you're starting to get more of what we had to start with. So we can check our numbers by adding watch point. So the maximum where it started is 0 0.05 and it just goes down from there. So that's how I'd be adding some variants in here and you can get you can see C cubes are turning up in the very branches of things it's getting a good look and of course what I like to do too is offer the option so maybe you don't want variants and, and that's really easy to do if I just put down a couple of if statements and we'll plug this one into the true and this one into the true and that, we can break these now so what we're saying is that if so if this condition is true my probability here 
it's going into the true case and it's going to be passed. But if this condition is false, then it's just going to send zero down this line. And that pretty much means that a zero probability just means it's not going to happen. And that's what it's, it's displaying now because ne neither of these conditions are on. If I turn this one on, you can see our variations have turned up. Before we do anything else, we'll run this out to the input. And we'll just use the same if statement for both for now. So this will switch off both of our, off and on both of our variants. And then we'll put this into a compound to keep things tidy. We'll just call it variance code. Cool. Awesome. Super, super close. Almost there now. There are some rendering tricks you can do to make these look more like they're folded into each other. You can use a uh, di dielectric ratio, I think it's called. Or you can also use Arnold's round corners if you're rendering straight out of Bifrost, which the renders that I showed you at the beginning were straight out of Bifrost. The very last thing I want to do is, is a rendering helper. It's, it's for anybody who's taking my renders or for me if I want to do things. I want to be able to change the colors of my fractals based on the iteration they were created on. Now, there's, a, there's zero, that's one, that's two, so on, so on, so on. So I'd, I'd like to be able to change the colors. But all I'm going to do to, to make that happen is I'm going to Add a property to my geo going out inside the loop. And I'm going to call that iteration ID. And I could call it Bob or George or Sue. It doesn't matter. But let's keep the semblance of professionalism going. We'll call it iteration ID. And then all I'm going to put out there is the current index. Because the current index is number of the iterations. So 0 is the first one. And 1 is the second one. And so on and so on. So why don't I show you what it looks like in action. Now, I'm not going to zoom in on this because it takes a little while to render. You can see that the shade has added a bunch of things too, like this bump map, which isn't quite right yet. But most importantly, you can see that the instance IDs we set up are showing up in the final render in the ability that I have to get different colors. And if I just wanted to see the instance IDs themselves, plug that in, give Arnold a minute, and it'll just show me random colors. But you get the idea. So that's about it, really. It's a... Uh, that's our fractal crystals. I really hope that you've learned some stuff. You can find me on the Discord. You can find me hanging around an Autodesk. Um, and I'll provide lots of links in the description. Feel free to reach out. And thank you very much and have a really good day. Cheers.